Okay. Uh, hey, Josh. Are hey. you good? You good, Josh? Okay. I'm good. We're gonna, we're gonna put you on the big screen. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna shift this in if we're doing if we're not doing split screen. Okay. One for that. Okay, everyone. So I just want to briefly um, introduce to the second speaker that we have today. Um, this is Josh, and he's uh, the executive secretary of Appia. I'll let him explain what he does, but he will give a real um, perspective of what's happening in the Indo-Pacific region and Latin America in regards to insects for food and feed. Um, so the floor is yours, Josh. Um, can we give a round of applause to Josh, please? Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Van House, for that very informative overview of the industry. Um, he touched on so many topics, so it'll make it pretty easy for me um, to just go a little bit more granular with details on AFIA and uh, some of the things that I've been working with. Um, and I'll, some, of, some of the things I was going to mention, he already spoke about, so um, I will gloss over those things and then leave time for questions at the end. Um, as Justin said, my name is Josh Galt. Uh, I work with Afia in Southeast Asia, the Asian Food and Feed Insect Association. Um, we work with a variety of countries in the ASEAN region, as well as uh, having members around the world now. Um, we started with about 10 members, and now we're up to 37 members in all of the different ASEAN countries, uh, as well as members from Switzerland, Bangladesh, uh, Japan, which are outside of, of the Southeast Asian area. Um, and we've been doing a lot of collaboration as well, uh, being sort of the representative for the area, uh, collaborating with IPIF, uh, which is the European organization with NASIA in North America, with the IPAA in Australia, as well as, as other associations that are starting to come up. There's one in Latin America and one in Africa. Um, <clears throat> So our areas of operation are um, basically threefold. Uh, regulatory clarification, um, which is a lot of what IPIP does in Europe and they've been the world leader on regulation. Um, we work with market access, collaboration and education as well uh, for companies in the region, both for um, regional trade and, and market access as well as international. And then just general promotion of the industry. So uh, a lot of, of the things that we've been doing as an organization and as, as the AFIA Executive Committee is attending many events around the region, especially general agriculture events, um, which are, are not so much focused on insects, but we have been able to represent the insect industry at those events for both food and feed. Um, and it's been really interesting to see the response the last couple of years from VCs, from governments, uh, from NGOs, from academia, in the, the level of education uh, that has come about insects as food and feed and for waste management and other uses, um, and also played a role in people's greater interest in it. Um, but I think a lot of, of the research and the new developments that have happened have also spurned that, that uh, or, or been the spark that's, that's brought about that interest as well. Um, so we, we also work with different universities uh, in the region, uh, especially in Thailand. So our headquarters are in Bangkok and our coordinator is, has, he's from France, but he has been doing, um, a PhD program in Thailand and, and um, with some other PhD students from Thailand. So we work closely with Kasatsart University, which is in Bangkok. Um, there's also another university in Thailand, Khon Ken University, which is very famous. Uh, Dr. Yupa Hanbun Song has done a lot of research and, and um, was part of that original FAO report as well. So in the area, there's a, a definite hub for research and development and, and things that are happening uh, with this industry. Um, so that's a little bit about AFIA and, so, and sort of where we are connected in the region, um, as well as with all of the private companies and whatnot that's happening. 
the exciting things that, that are happening in the region are the developments with uh, the specific insects. So I'll get to what research topics may interest you um, in a little bit, because there's definitely some research collaboration that can happen uh, between Europe and, and Asia. Uh, but some of the things that have happened just, just in the last couple of years, um, to, to give you a sort of a big picture overview, the, the industry is basically broken up by food and feed in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, China is sort of its own thing, so I'm not going to touch on China. Um, it's kind of its own industry. It's, it has its own regulations and policies and, and whatnot. But the rest of Asia, um, primarily black soldier fly for feed, is focused in Malaysia. And for food, it's mostly crickets, uh, which is focused in Thailand. So some of the, a couple of the, the really notable things that have happened um, recently are with black soldier fly. Uh, there's a company now in Malaysia, there's, there's six or seven companies in Malaysia that are all doing really interesting work with black soldier fly. But one in particular the last six months uh, has been able to consistently get above 65% protein uh, with their dried larva, which is, as far as I know, the highest in the world. Most of the time, just dried, non-defatted, so it still has the fat, um, black soldier fly larvae are between 38 and, and 45% protein. And they've been able to get very easily 55%, but consistently they're now able to get 65% plus, which is really interesting because of the, the opportunity that this presents for more research um, based on the substrate, the feedstock that they are that they have access to in the region, um, as well as just the, the temperature from the climate, all of those things that is just natural um, and native to the area. So that's one interesting thing. There's another company that has um, what they're claiming to be the world's first patented uh, black soldier fly oil for cosmetic use. Um, so that's the development that's happened since mid last year. Um, I know that there are many companies, there's companies in Europe as well as other areas that are researching oil use uh, from insects and especially black soldier fly. Um, it's, a, it's a great antimicrobial uh, food or feed component for animal feed and pet food. Uh, but it's also, it has numerous application possibilities for beauty and, and skincare and cosmetics as well. So um, they were able to get a, a patent on their process of extraction of the, the lipids and are promoting that now uh, for skincare. On the cricket side, uh, it's, as I said, it's mostly focused on Thailand. And there's, it's difficult to count the exact number. Um, the numbers range from official government statistics now, which are around five or 6,000, um, the last that, that we were told sort of their estimate, up to the 20 or 30,000 uh, farmer number um, that's, that's the standard um, that we heard from the, the FAO report in 2013. So it's tough to, to tell exactly how many there are because there's so many rural areas, but as technology advances into those rural areas, it will be easier to, to get a, an exact idea on how big the industry really is. And another thing that has happened in Thailand that was a, a very notable thing for Asia um, is the Thai government initiated the world's first um, GAP standardization for smallhold farmers um, because there are so many thousands of farmers uh, uh, around Thailand. They, I think it was two years ago that that went into effect and they, there's been updates to it and now it's spreading around the region as well to bring the smallhold farmers up to a global standard because smallhold agriculture is still the majority of food production in the world. Um, as much as like 70% of the world's food is produced by smallhold farmers. It's not we think of our food coming from massive factories because that's the end brand. But in reality, the food is actually produced, most of it, whether it's contract farmers or just smallhold farmers for regional sale. Um, so insect farming can play a big role in that as well um, as we bring the, the standard for the smallhold farmers up to an international GAP and GMP and, and getting more of those certifications for export but even just for having a higher standard within the country for domestic use. Um, there's also a new hub that's being built in Singapore 
uh, which you may have heard about because there's their Innova feed um, and AgriProtein both are planning to set up there. AgriProtein already has, but Innova feed is also uh, planning to set up headquarters there. And they're looking for other companies to do or other people, other startups to do research in this agri-food hub. Uh, it's something that will be, they're planning for it to come online sometime next year. Uh, it's going to be very focused on research and development. Singapore has a, a goal of being completely self-sufficient uh, within a decade, which if you know about Singapore, it's, it's a small uh, city state. It's an island. Uh, so for them right now, they're importing pretty much everything. And so for them to be self-sufficient means that they're going to have to be very creative with vertical farming, with insect farming, with uh, closed loop systems that are that are circular to you know, upcycle waste into protein, et cetera. So there's there's some exciting developments in the region for sure. Um, and there's there's been a lot of changes. I've I've been um, in Asia since about 2012, full time since 2013. And so just over the last seven years, that I've seen just a massive amount of change. And in this industry specifically, just in the last two or three years, there's been a, a great amount of change. So. It's, it's an exciting place to be, um, and there's a lot of collaboration opportunities. So a few of those uh, that you might be interested in if you're a research student or a company that's looking for a potential opportunity where you can find some new developments, um, and I'll just list them off if you want to, if you're taking notes. Um, and you, I can give you this, uh, the, the slides as well uh, after. But the feed stock for insects as feed is going to be a big thing. Uh, disease prevention for BSFL and cricket farming. Um, sustainability data for industrial production. Nutrients in the insect frass. And high value uses for chitin and insect oil. So going back to the top on that, feed stock is really interesting because Asia has such a diverse amount of clean agricultural waste. So whether it's production from soybean, from palm, the palm oil uh, industry, from coconut, from uh, rice, from other things, there's a, a, a large amount of waste that we don't think of necessarily as food waste uh, because it's not really a consumer food product. It's more of an agro waste. So if you hear the term agro waste, that's what it's referring to. Soybean, soybean meal, palm kernel meal. Uh, these things that are, are a byproduct of those other industries. But it's very easy to upcycle those as they make really good feed, generally, uh, for these different insects. And so that's part of where the research by the companies that are in the area uh, and the universities have, has gone into. But there's so much more opportunity to figure out how can they be used and in what uh, mixes, what percentages in order to to generate different nutrient compositions in the insects. And so that's how you're, you're, we're, we're starting to see a lot more variation where companies, just by shifting the, the ratio of feedstock that goes into, for example, black soldier fly, they're able to shift the percentage from 28% you know, fat down to 12% fat and the protein from 39% fat up to 65% fat or higher, or sorry, protein. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting sort of sector that's, that's just starting to really develop in, in terms of research um, because all of these things are just so plentiful and they've never really been used before. They've just been waste. So not only is it cleaning, the you're, you're getting rid of the, the composting, the rotting um, of, of these waste products, but you're upcycling them into the amazing protein that, that are edible insects for, for feed mostly. Um, but it's also an opportunity to figure out ways because, for example, for the cosmetic industry, you want a very high fat insect, you want the oil, but you want it to have certain properties. And so the research opportunities there are just limitless. And that's, that's only the beginning and just talking about basically two insects. And there's myriad more, of course, and across the region and, and globally. So um, that's one major opportunity for research. Another one which has been discussed at length is, is disease prevention. Um, that's something that is very challenging, especially for smallhold farmers, because a lot of times they don't, 
they don't keep good records, uh, they don't have the data, they don't really understand what happened, why did my entire population of crickets get wiped out in overnight, like what happened? And so more research into disease prevention for, for crickets and also for black soldier fly, and that's something that's happening globally. Um, but in Asia, there's also opportunity because of the different, uh, the, the insects are farmed in a different way uh, compared to, for example, in a closed temperature control facility in Europe, in Asia, they're, they're farmed in a, in a much more open manner because the temperature is ideal for farming black soldier fly pretty much year round. And so it's a, it's a different sort of thing where it's not as closed and as clinical as it would be uh, in Europe. And so there's other potential dangers uh, from it being more of an open, um, an open area where they're farming. Um, the data for, for industrial production is a, a big thing. It's something that, that I've been talking to a lot of people about the, the past year, especially because as the industry grows and as more and more awareness uh, is given to the sector in mainstream media and, and whatnot, it's really important for the industry to actually have data to verify the claims that are out there. So there's... You've probably seen infographics. There's so much information that since the FAO report in 2013 has been put out that, you know, the insects are, they use this much less water than beef and they use this much less land and, and they convert a thousand times less greenhouse gases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's a variety of those infographics out there that don't always have the same information. So what is true and how can we verify that it is true? So Data collection is going to be incredibly important and transparency with that. Um, and now with the advent of, of general ag and the, the amounts of investment that have come into general ag in the past few years, which has really grown as well. Um, but agriculture is still very, it's still at the very bottom in terms of uh, technology being used for the industry. It's still one of the, the lowest, if not the lowest uh, level of technology use for the industry. So there's a lot of opportunity with, with the internet of things, with blockchain, um, with tracking that data and tracking it from farm to fork. Uh, it's, it's going to be really important and it's also going to be really exciting because not only will farms be able to see what they're doing and how to do it more efficiently, uh, but they're going to be able to say, look, this is my data. This is, this is what I'm claiming and I can back it up now because we have proof. And one of the concerns with having that proof is that we can make claims and it's very exciting. And, and of course, we all believe that, yes, it's, I mean, obviously, anecdotally, just from looking at it rationally, we can see, yeah, this, this industry is so much more sustainable and the insects are very healthy. That we have the data on, the nutritional aspects. Um, but the sustainability part, we don't really have the verified proof yet. So towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030, 2050, in order to really play a larger, larger role um, and to get insects more into that mix of potential solutions, which right now they're kind of being left off because we don't have that data. So that's gonna be an area. So if you're an engineer or a researcher or you're interested in the idea of uh, traceability and transparency in the supply chain, whatever it is, there's a lot of research and development that can be done in that area with the insect industry to really improve how everything is functioning and, and really demonstrate how awesome that, that this industry is. Um, nutrients and insect frass is another one that's, that's pretty simple. Uh, it's figuring out exactly what those nutrients are from cricket frass, from BSF, from mealworms, from other insects as well that are farmed. Uh, and which plants they impact and how. So, for example, uh, BSF frass is said to be really good for papaya. And there's been studies that have been done in Malaysia where there's a lot of the BSF farms where they're using the frass with papaya and it's, it's just making the papaya grow much faster and larger. And so that's exciting. But it's, it still is more of an observational type of evidence than actually like doing really strict studies. And so that's an opportunity for research um, with the frass of the different insects as well and how they can, can be part of a, a closed loop system 
uh, with fruits and vegetables and, and organic farming. And then the uses for chitin and insect oil, um, that's a, a very limitless sort of sector because there's so many different things that uh, chitin has been potentially used for, or the studies that have come out over the past few years, as well as the oil. Everything from, as Professor Van Huys mentioned, the ice cream in, in South Africa with gourmet grub um, and, and other areas to cosmetics and there's to biofuels. There's all sorts of different things that it can be used for. So research and, and the collaborative opportunities between universities and, and companies in Europe um, and in Asia, there's a lot of companies and, and as well as uh, universities in Asia that would love to do uh, projects with universities and, and startups in Europe as well. So uh, that's something that we at Appia as an organization is, is looking for to connect those, those people together to do those type of, of things. Um, technology growth in Asia is one of the things that is so exciting about this region. Um, and I'll just touch on it really quickly, but the penetration into rural areas has grown incredibly fast. Um, Google did some projections in 2016 and they just came out with a report last year saying, wow, that what really has happened the last three years blew our projections out of the water. Um, it's the internet economy in, in Southeast Asia alone hit more than a hundred billion dollars last year, uh, which was considerably more than, than even Google's projections. Um, and it's growing at an estimated 40% a year. So that's not only in the major cities where you have tens of millions of people, but it's also in the rural areas. Um, the penetration into those areas is going incredibly fast. So you can go into almost any rural area now in Cambodia or Laos or Myanmar or Thailand, especially Vietnam, and people have mobile phones and they're, they're figuring out how to use them. And so as technology can be developed for agriculture, and this is one of the big themes that I've been seeing at the different agriculture focused conferences uh, in Asia the past couple of years, as that gets developed, we can do things with that, with insects as well, to really combine everything together with smallhold agriculture and insect farming to create those closed loop circular systems which are then incorporating insects as feed, insects uh, uh, or the, the traditional livestock and, and aquaculture farming. So you're using insects as feed for that. And then insects as food for human consumption and then the frass from the insects um, for organic fertilizer for fruits and vegetables. And then you're able to then take food waste from those areas. Even if it's small areas, you're able to take the organic food waste and put it back into the system. And so you come out with a completely sustainable closed loop system which is basically zero waste and every player in that is getting what they need in a very sustainable manner so and insects are playing a very vital role because their feed their food their frass their waste management so all of the things that that make up the component of a, a closed loop system and a circular system uh, in terms of agriculture insects can play a very vital role and so that's where technology also comes in to be able to manage that because otherwise it's, it's very difficult. It's still hard enough to keep track of just farming a, you know, a pond of, of black soldier fly or, or pans of crickets or BSF or mealworms without technology. But um, trying to do an entire circular system without technology is almost impossible. So to be able to incorporate things like Ag Unity, uh, which is a, a mobile, uh, mobile device and app, uh, geared towards smallhold farmers in the developing world, which then ties back into blockchain and you're able to track everything literally from those farms, no matter how rural, all the way to the consumers, uh, as well as uh, a company out of Lithuania called Cogastro, which is focused on insect solutions specifically for insect farming. So collecting the data on sustainability, on how much energy is used and, and greenhouse gases and water um, and feed and all of those things, as well as making the farming more efficient. So it's, it ties back into the whole thing of we need more data, systems like that, and, and that's the first one that I know of that's focused exclusively on the insect farming uh, sector. Uh, more and more will probably come online, but, but even just having a system like that that can be plugged in to these different areas 
and the focus, especially in Asia, being on smallhold farming, uh, it's, it's going to make for a very exciting few years as this really, really starts to blossom and this whole ecosystem of general agriculture and waste management and feed production and livestock production and human food all sort of merge together and, and have synergy. Um, and one thing, so the, you might have questions about into vegan. I wasn't really going to talk too much about it, um, but it's been mentioned several times. So I'll just touch on this with regard to the growth of the, the vegan, uh, plant-based diet in the West. I'm sure you're familiar with, with how fast that's grown in, in Europe and in the U S the past few years. It's not really practical for the developing world. Uh, because as the, the population is going to grow to 9 billion, 10 billion, whatever the figure ends up in 2050, most of that population growth, almost all of it, is coming from the developing world. And so as those people, as those cultures, as those nations get wealthier, they want to eat things that are different from what they ate when they were poor. I think that's just a natural human tendency. And so there's going to always be meat consumption. Um, whether it's sustainable or not is kind of not the point for these cultures that are developing because they're going to want to eat beef and chicken and fish um, and pork. They, they want to eat traditional meat. So where we can play a role without being too utopian um, in the idea of, well, the whole world should just go vegan because that's, that's not really practical. But where we can play a role is insects as feed make the feedstock and way more sustainable for the traditional livestock. And so you're getting rid of two very incredibly unsustainable indus industries, which is fish meal. We've overfished the oceans massively. And so insects like black soldier fly and mealworms can replace fish meal in the diets of aquaculture, shrimp, poultry, uh, even baby piglets. And so you're, you're basically replacing one unsustainable industry with another that is very, very sustainable. And so rather than being very dogmatic about it, um, it's to be very practical of, okay, in the big picture of all of planet Earth and all of humanity over the next 30 years, how can we make the most practical, the most realistic steps toward a more sustainable, healthy planet? And insects play a very vital role in that. Uh, so long as we're able to to be rational with it and and not expect that the entire population is going to eat insects, but okay, how can we plug insects into these other areas that are unsustainable, as well as get people to to eat insects? Because of course that's that's important and that's exciting too. But um, just to close, and then I'll leave it for questions. And I know there's other questions as well for Dr. Professor uh, Van Hoss. Um, but the EU and, and Asia collaboration is really, really important, especially right now. So in the past year, there's been some EU regulations which have basically blocked uh, companies in Asia from continuing to export to the EU. Um, there's the novel foods uh, issues and, and there's some other regulations. So EU, the EU is sort of seen as the global leader in regulation. And it's, it's a very important role uh, in terms of food safety and feed safety and, and all of those things. But um, it's Im important to, to realize that um, in working together, we're going to be able to create more of a global ecosystem. And so there's many opportunities uh, for breakthrough in Asia, as I mentioned, um, with the, the climate, the geography, um, a lot of the regulatory framework in Asia allows for experimentation um, and innovation. And so right now, as of December, um, companies are not allowed to export to the EU. And so this is one thing that AFIA is working on, uh, working with IFIF as well, and, and something that um, is an area that, that we can collaborate uh, with everyone that's in Europe um, to make it so that it does work uh, because there, there's a saying in English um, that a rising tide raises all ships and so as as we are able to work together to the benefit of the Asian companies and the the EU companies it's going to benefit everyone in the industry and I've seen 
uh, a little bit in recent months, especially since that uh, that initial blockade went into effect. There's still three company or three countries that can export to the EU: um, uh, Switzerland, Canada, and South Korea. Um, but as far as the other major hubs of production, Thailand and Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, they're no longer right now allowed to export to the EU. Um, and I've seen some celebration of that from companies uh, in the EU, which is a little bit frustrating for all of us that are that are working in Asia to to be able to export to the EU and, and want to collaborate because um, at this point, first of all, we need to work together, but also competition and, and having a free market encourages innovation. And so when it's artificially blocked by regulation, um, which still is sort of in process, then it stifles that innovation. And so then it's going to segment the world apart to where Asia is just going to do its own thing and the EU is going to do its own thing. When in reality, we should be working together to collaborate um, because together, uh, I think there's, there's massive opportunity. Obviously, there's exciting things happening in North America and Australia and Africa as well. Um, it's starting to, to come about in, in Latin America with changes. But I, I think the, the major hubs at this point um, for insects as food and feed and, and waste management and, and upcycling of, of all of those other byproducts um, are Europe and Asia. And so if we can work together in, on all of these research topics on regulation, uh, on production, um, we will be able to more synergistically lead the world forward and lead this sector forward uh, in all of those areas. Because um, in Europe, there's so much research and development that, that is happening and so many great universities and, and startups that are doing really exciting work. Um, and then also the EU is sort of leading the charge on policy. And in Asia, there's a lot of R&D that's happening as well from different perspectives. But the production is, is absolutely massive and it's, it has really big upside because of the weather and because of the feedstock and all of those things. So um, I would encourage whether you're in government or, or startup or academia or working with NGOs or whatever it is to um, our goal uh, with AFIA especially and, and most of the, the com private companies in Asia is really to collaborate uh, with the organizations and companies and, and governments outside of Asia because we want to take the the opportunities that are there and, and transfer them to the rest of the world and, and be able to work with the knowledge and opportunities in other places to, to bring them to Asia as well to, to build the sector. So um, I have, uh, if you have any questions about AFIA or Intovegan or uh, any other topics related to insects as food and feed in Asia, I didn't really touch on Latin America too much, um, but there are interesting things and exciting things happening there. It's just, um, a little bit slower and uh, a few years behind, I would say, um, Asia. Um, but right. well, can we please give a round of applause to Josh uh, for his presentation? <laughs> and I really do appreciate Josh because he's uh, calling from Los Angeles, and uh, we really appreciate that breakdown of what the Asia Pacific.